Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 23 of Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and we have something very special for you this evening. Tonight's double feature serves up some mystery along with the macabre, with two tales about, you guessed it, coffins and corpses. With tonight's episode being a little longer than normal, we're going to skip some of the pleasantries and just jump right into it. But first, have an ad break. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Taking a quick break here to show some love to a sponsor that's shown so much to us, BetterHelp Online Therapy. I love to read books and play games on my phone in my downtime. I once knew someone a long time ago that had to avoid certain types of television because they got too invested. If something bad happened in the show, it would cause them deep emotional unrest for the remainder of the day. Then, on the other hand, I also had a friend who literally cried when he noticed a scratch on his used car. My point is that the smallest things can grab the investment of your time and emotional resources. Sadly, too often your own mental health isn't something that's on that list. I admit that in the past, checking in on my mental health wasn't something I thought about much, if at all, really. We all know how our mind affects how we experience life, so it's important to invest time and care into keeping it healthy. There are plenty of ways to support a healthy brain like learning a new language or skill. However, there's also BetterHelp Online Therapy. BetterHelp is online therapy that'll help you deal with life's difficulties quickly, conveniently, and inexpensively. It's helped me through countless situations. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with a therapist who specializes in your unique difficulties, whether it be grief, stress, anxiety, fear, depression, etc. You can text anytime and schedule calls or Zoom meetings weekly. With BetterHelp, help is never more than a text away. It's professional counseling in your pocket. Horror Hill podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horror hill. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror hill. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. 
If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Our first story of the evening takes us to quite a strange event. A beheaded woman is found on a perfect circle of dead grass in a San Francisco park. Buried beneath this are more bodies, both human and animal, extending back to when the earth was young. What is the source of this ancient magnet for death, and how do investigators defeat its mysterious and deadly source? From author Stephen Aguilera, I give you The Devil's Grave. Two stone lions guard the entrance of Sutro Heights Park. A small dog, similarly posed, reclines beside them. Holding its leash, a black man in his sixties leans on a well-worn cane. Two policemen approach. A blonde woman in a pantsuit tags after. I'm Sergeant West, the middle-aged man states. He introduces his rook. Officer Rico. The young patrolman wiggles his fingers at the wagging pug. The woman glances at the dog indifferently, holding her badge with a strained smile. Detective Bugby. The man looks her over and smirks. Follow me. He leads them through the morning San Francisco fog. They arrive at a savagely mutilated blonde woman with a nearly severed head. Her final instant of terror can still be discerned on what's left of her clenched face. The detective stares. Did a human even do this? The dog whimpers. Easy, girl, the man responds. I estimate it's been here five hours. The lack of blood or clothing suggests she was murdered elsewhere. But look, no flies. Isn't that odd? The sergeant darts a suspicious look his way. You in law enforcement, sir? The man returns a smug grin. No. Then why aren't you throwing up right now? Dr. Daniel G. Dace, mortician. I've seen it all. Bugby locks eyes with him. Then, sir, can you explain why everything else ten feet around her body is dead, too? Disconcerted, Dace and the police officers look down and around. Indeed, the corpse lays in the center of a perfect circle of sparse dead grass. The rook takes him by the arm, startling him. Sir, please step back. The body could be radioactive for all we know. Dace turns to find his dog already standing outside of the circle. A week follows. Dace approaches the crime scene with his pug. Sacks of fertilizer sit beside an Americanized Chinese man in his thirties, tearing up the soil with a motorized tiller. Excuse me, I'm the one who found the body here last week? Dace goes mostly unheard and ignored as the bony man wrestles with his machine. With a tap on his shoulder, he finds Detective Bugby forcing a delighted face. Dr. Dace, is there something I can help you with, sir? The groundkeeper's big, thick glasses magnify his eyes as he glimpses her backside. Oh, have they determined how the remains created this? This odd, dead circle? Well, we are still in the process of... Wait! The groundskeeper interjects. Who'd you say you are? I'm the one to interview. I've been spreading fertilizer over these 15 years. 
He pauses to reflect on his life choices. Dace's eyes grow wide. Fifteen years. Don't rub it in. No, I mean, what in heaven's name would cause... The frail man switches off his motor. I'll tell you exactly what, and you can quote me. An unidentified flying saucer. Thank you, Chai, says the detective. Her disinterest in his theory is not lost on him as he restarts his tiller. The dog grows apprehensive. Have there been reports of UFOs landing here, detective? I didn't say anything about landing, Chai shouts. It's deep down there. Must have crashed before the Great Ice Age and still shooting deadly cosmic rays up through my lawn. Noting the dog's behavior, Bugby gasps. Stop! Startled and then perturbed, Chai powers down. She slips on a latex glove, reaches into the soil, and extracts a human ear. Looks like you missed some, Chai remarks. His patronizing tone is not lost on her. Dace inserts himself. No, this one is much older. The next morning finds a tent over their location. The detective and Dace watch as crime scene investigators unearth the severed head of another blonde woman, but with a missing ear. Bugby peers with Sergeant West, who nods. By his side, Rico observes. So, what are you a doctor of? I hold a doctorate in theology. He pauses. That's the study of religious truth. She smiles politely. Thank you. Are you a minister then, too? Yes. You spiritual at all yourself? No. The conversation fizzles. Um... In your opinion, Doctor, could these murders be ritualistic? Decapitated blondes in a circle probably symbolizes something. But you don't know. He gives her a side look. The sergeant smiles with his eyes. With some kind of ace up her sleeve, she peeks at the others. Well, Dr. Dace, when would you place the time of death on this one? He squats to the remains leaning heavily on his cane. Clearly still in the first stage of decomposition, yet it would take months to dry out to this degree. How can that be in this climate? She crosses her arms with an air of self-satisfaction. He gathers his thoughts. Of course, the killer must have used excessive quicklime to mask the smell and repel animals, disintegrated the rest of her body, and killed everything around it, too. Also acts as a dehydrating agent, explaining the mummified state. He stands proudly. The rook seems impressed. Bugby offers an empty nod. Interesting, but based on her fashion sense and initial tests, it appears she's been down there for 90 years, and we found no trace of quicklime or anything else to explain her lack of decomposition. Because even the bacteria are dead. Dace frowns. Gazing upon the twenty-five-foot round patch of the barren earth, a look of realization washes over him. She opens her mouth to discount his theory, but cannot. Oh, you didn't catch that? He asks. She glances at her disenchanted sergeant. Dace leans in. Either way, this scratches me off your suspect list. She clams up. Detective, let's take a walk. Avoiding eye contact with everyone, she follows him out. He leads her down the main dirt path in earshot of the Pacific. This park, it was named after Adolf Sutro. He was born in Aachen, Prussia in 1830 and made his fortune in the silver mining industry. How interesting, she says in a snotty, sing-song voice. In 1881, he bought what became Sutro Heights and constructed a public garden filled with statues, forests, and even a hedge maze. His family lived here in a cottage. His daughter remained until she died in 1938. She halts. That's about when this Jane Doe died. She was laid to rest elsewhere. He resumes their stroll. Oh. They approach the park gateway. 
The family donated it all to the city, and it was demolished a year later except for these two stone lions still guarding the entrance. They pass a historical plaque with a description of the original estate. Sorry, I'm confused. How exactly does all of this tie in with our murder scene? That's just it. None of it does. Sutro did have some bad luck, but his successes in the end far outweighed his failures. I cannot explain why those woman's remains were placed at that spot on his former estate, nine decades apart. Some piece of her appreciates his honesty. A thought unsettles him. And never mind that it would take something inhuman to kill like that, and for this long. There's a crash from the tent. Charging back, she leaves him hobbling behind. Finally reaching the site, he attempts to steady his breathing. The sergeant and rookie heave an injured investigator from a breech wooden layer in the center of the lifeless circle. What is that? Rico asks. A coffin? Sergeant West studies the damage. Your thoughts? Bugby puts on a confident face. Well, this whole park actually used to be the land of Rudolf Sutro. The rook corrects her. Adolf. She tells him, shut up, in a perky way. The sergeant grimaces. Detective. And, she continues, it had this old graveyard. She snaps her fingers, which also explains this woman from the 1930s. West nods. I was asking Dr. Dace. She recoils. Dace stoops and peers into the dark cavity. I believe you're rushing to conclusions. She shrinks and gives Rico a dirty look. Two hours go by. A ladder is lowered through the dim, dusty air. Chai pokes his head down and snorts deeply. Whoa, spooky. Ew, gross. Bugby slaps his shoulder. Move. The ladder creaks as she descends into the cottage's cellar with a flashlight. The cellar is thick with dust. Furniture and broken statues are piled here and there. Quite a coincidence this was directly under the crime scene, Dace says from above. She looks to him and gives pause, then grips her growing headache. There's a thud, followed by a settling sound. She draws her firearm and creeps toward a dark doorway. It leads to a collapsed hallway. Chai brightens up. Hey Gwen, ever watch Unsolved Paranormal Investigation Files? She holsters her weapon and groans. That's not exactly standard procedure. Five days elapse. Dace, running late, yanks open the tent. He is startled by a woman with big hair and a spray tan two shades too dark. She shrieks and scurries around him while holding her chest. Close behind is a crew with cameras, mics, and other curious equipment. Chai follows with Bugby, both gasping amid swirls of dust. What happened? Everyone okay? Grinning, Bugby elbows her way to the front. Dr. Dace, thank you, but... Dust! The psychic theatrically declares with a Texas accent. That's what happened! I have asthma! I could have died down there! Dace shows confusion. But... No presence? No evidence or impressions? I'm not at all psychic, and that place at least gives me the heebie-jeebies. The psychic glares at Bugby. I felt nothing down there at all. Let's go. Wishing she were somewhere else, Bugby gives Chai an icy stare. With the dust settling, Bugby descends into the cellar. All results still come up negative for any significant toxins or pathogens. We've even tested for radiation. Dace follows, letting out a cough. Regardless of our symptoms or their cause, it's clear that once we step out, our bodies do rejuvenate. She sits on a folding chair and pouts. Fixating on a dead rat, his discouragement weighs heavily. 
The key to all this has to be down here somewhere. This place, it's like a magnet for death. He collects his thoughts. Detective, do you think it a coincidence I was here when both bodies were found? A chill runs up her spine. Why do you ask that? Death's lure? He senses the weight of her scrutiny. I am a mortician. She looks him dead in the eye. And I'm in homicide. He gives her a prolonged side look and then smiles. We're not so different. She starts fake coughing. He sits beside her. This may surprise you, detective, but I haven't always been this happy-go-lucky. Death and I have been chasing each other my whole life. He coughs and waves his cane. I consider myself a detective of sorts, trying to crack the greatest mystery of them all. Let me guess. You with a Bible, me with a gun. He goes serious. One might question God, but no one can question death. It is the one certainty that no one can deny. She tenders no response. He chokes and takes deliberate breaths. It is dusty in here. But that's not why you can't breathe, is it? He looks down self-consciously. She regards him with some sympathy, but snaps herself out of it. Her flashlight lingers on the floor where something catches her eye. You see that? Yeah, that's a lot of dead bugs. No, wood's not rotted here. She kneels and brushes away debris. He leans in. And there's a faint discoloration across here. She follows it around the room with her light. It's a giant circle. He gives her an astonished look. That's actually a sharp observation there, detective. She flashes a sickly smile. Thanks. Nearly a month comes to pass. The site has become a research excavation. A team of half a dozen students from the University at Berkeley combs a large circular area of unnoteworthy soil. At the center, a pretty but exhausted young woman mutters, Is that... is that a... Her professor steps in and brushes soil from a mummified female's head having long blonde hair. The fuck? These are like no human remains I've seen. Chai rushes in. Is that bitch alien? Let me see. A little respect, Dace shouts from the opposite side. No, the professor says. I mean, these aren't modern. I don't know how old, but the preservation is fucking remarkable. Dace examines it with wonder. Dear God, how far back does this go? Bugby observes from the surface with dark circles around her eyes. Her phone buzzes. It reads, Call from Sergeant West. She lets it go to voicemail. In another month, a stone sacrificial altar was uncovered at the center. The heads of hundreds of women are piled around it, preserved with disturbing detail, down to their final expressions. They end abruptly around the circle's edge. Anything beyond long reduced to dust. The crew has gone for the day. Dr. Dace presents his observations with a pretentious flair to Chai, who films them. What is it? Genetic memory? I don't know. But for centuries, Western art depicted angels as blonde, as if purer, the opposite of evil. In the shadows behind the seated men, Bugby eavesdrops. Still, there shouldn't have been any blondes here yet. Who were these people? How did they get here? Chai pans to their remains. Dickwick cavemen are trying to appease some Dickwick curse. Dace looks glumly upon their grisly setting. It's more than that. It would seem that this circle doesn't just kill. It compels one to kill others. Ill at ease... Chai lowers his camera. 
With regretful eyes, Dace mumbles, but cutting off their heads still doesn't make the pain disappear. His startling statement captures Bugby's attention. Chai raises his eyebrows. Realizing what slipped from his mouth, Dace gives him a long, sinister side look. Bugby motions toward her Glock 22. No one moves a muscle. Dace winks. Chai exhales loudly. Dick, you almost gave me a heart attack. Well, this place could use some levity. Frustrated, Bugby collects herself. Chai settles down. And Gwen still has no clue who killed that bitch, uh, lady. Dace goes sober. Half the park tore up, and she still hasn't even found her clothes. Yeah, she should just go back to a burglary at this point. Everyone knows by now she's a shitty homicide detective. Decent titties, though. And what's your theory? She challenges. Chai flinches. Alien autopsy? No, he says with a red, pouty face. She targets Dace. Or, let me guess, the Antichrist? A demon? You should keep your mind open to all possibilities, detective. She stares daggers at him. Oh, I have been. He takes a breath. And have you noticed? Everyone starts off real gung-ho here, but turns bored real quick. Then there's an argument or an all-out fistfight. Eventually, it's like they're dead inside. We keep making stupid mistakes, having accidents, and getting sick. Never mind the host of mental disorders. Like paranoia, Chai boldly asserts. She steps into his personal space and moistens her lips. With a feminine touch, she places a caressing hand on his shoulder, her breasts near his face. His smugness evaporates. He tries to look away, but succumbs and begins to sweat. She holds out her palm. You are pure evil, he grumbles while handing over his camera. Dace smirks. But I don't believe in curses myself, dickwit or otherwise. And I'm sure modern man can address whatever's down here. We just need to keep our cool. Besides, everything encountered so far has been harmlessly dead. Chai looks at the innumerable corpses. That's not very comforting. Riveted by something, Bugby charges to the altar. Fresh blood transfers to her fingers, touching the back of a severed head. She reveals the face of the pretty Berkeley student, frozen with a look of shock. Dace and Chai stand. Pulling her weapon, she swings it at them. Chai carefully positions himself to shield Dace. Get out of the circle, Gwen! Seething with hate, she shows great inner conflict. Detective! She looks up to find Sergeant West scowling from the surface. Gun drawn, Rico looks anxiously to him for direction. Dace's recent words sink in, and she lowers her firearm. Rico rushes his way down. She makes reluctant eye contact with her sergeant. He does not look happy. Now, twenty feet deeper, another two months have elapsed. With dead eyes, Dace perches himself above the dig. Large and small mummified dinosaurs are being uncovered from compacted volcanic ash. They appear to have died in anguish. The giant head and torso of a terrifying, unknown beast lay before him. Another three months transpire. Dace is donned in minister's robes at his mortuary. A family grieves before an open casket. Staring at a vase of white roses, he extracts one. His phone buzzes. From Chai Loom. Message. Dan, you won't believe this. He raises an eyebrow. An hour later, he finds himself back at Sutro Heights Park. 
From the surface, he looks down onto a gleaming black 25-foot-wide disc deep in the excavation. Chai looks like he hasn't slept in days, but is nonetheless elated. Shit's at least 150 million years old based on the dinosaurs above it. Dumbfounded, Dace musters the question, A flying saucer? No, come with me. Chai rushes them to the bottom level. It's a flat piece of polished stone, about five feet thick, formed into a mathematically perfect circle. Dace visually inspects the smooth, precise surface. Exquisite. Cautiously, he reaches out to it, but retracts and looks at Chai. Go ahead. With a light touch, he recoils. Cold. Not according to any thermometer. Is this granite? More or less. Geologists say nothing like it in the area, and no markings of any kind. Dace is mystified. What could be its purpose? And how is it so toxic to life? Bugby chimes in. Take a look on top. He is briefly bewildered at seeing her in a standard police uniform. Inspecting the top surface, he discovers a faint, discolored circle around it. Oh, you didn't catch that? She asks, her venom thinly veiled. Whatever's under, Chai says. It's powerful enough to burn that ring through this thick-ass stone and the 40 feet of the stuff above it. Pretty sure someone was trying real hard to block that shit, like a shield. Dace smiles. Resembles a grave marker. Chai perks up. So you think it's a tomb? I am a mortician, but at this point I'm wondering if we'll let the devil out if we dig deep enough. It preserved everything else, says Chai. Their attention shifts to Bugby's chilling stare, mutating into a soft, demented smile. After a month of preparation, the tent has been replaced with a massive crawler crane, its steel cabling securely affixed to the mysterious megalith. A heavy chain also encircles the piece, adjoined to a bulldozer beside it at the bottom of the excavation. It is mid-afternoon. Dace spells things out. It's Berkeley's call now, Sergeant. Worst case scenario, we have a backup shield constructed and ready. Sergeant West takes in the scale of the operation. With some indignity, Bugby stands in uniform beside Rico, the rookie. The hulking bulldozer down at the base powers up with a boom. The colossal crane beside them grumbles to life. They move back to a safe distance, now unable to see below. Sweating, Dace consciously controls his breathing. Rico gestures to the sign of the cross. The mighty crane's engine heaves, but soon strains to its limit. The operator looks at the signal person and shakes his head. But with a tug from the bulldozer, the ancient stonework abruptly separates from the earth. There's a deafening moan as smoke and ash shoot upward. The signal person indicates, all stop. Their tension mounts as they wait an extended period for the haze to dissipate. The signal person eventually nods to someone below and, with a simple hand gesture, orders the lift to continue. Rising several meters, a loud snap jolts the crew. The Goliath stone shows a fracture. The signal person urgently motions for the operator to lower it back down, but it's too late. The stone buckles, and its immense pieces crash in a plume of soot. They creep forward to witness the damage beneath. The atmosphere settles, revealing a perfectly circular pit. Dace stares in awe. An abyss? The sergeant looks to Rico and then to Dace. Like a bottomless pit? Biblically, the abyss is the beast's abode and the dead's common receptacle. Hell. Wait, says Bugby. The bulldozer. 
The crew is aghast at the revelation that the formidable machine and its occupant had been taken with the falling chunks. The sun is now several hours set. Chai steps off the ladder and onto the excavation base, electrical cables draped over him every which way. He helps Dace find stable footing off the bottom rung. Wearing a backpack, Bugby descends next with three vest harnesses and rope. Unable to see the surface above them through the fog, she raises a walkie-talkie. Radio check. Roger, West replies. Chai snorts, hawks, and launches a thick mixture of mucus and saliva into the abyss from a few yards away. That's disgusting, she shouts. All that. Hey, yells Dace. A little respect? Bugby looks Chai in the eye for a drawn-out moment and then tosses him his camera. He shrieks and catches it. He switches it on, pointing it at her face, intentionally stunning her with blinding light. Oh good, you charged it. Chai, this isn't that show. Just document. Finally, I'll be hosting that shit after this. Dace beholds the round, unholy abomination. This is bad. She takes off her backpack. Then you shouldn't have volunteered us. He closes his eyes and recites, He opened the bottomless pit, and a cloud of smoke arose, the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened. Chai directs the camera at him. Chai! Chai! She shouts. Can you turn that dang light off and plug us in, please? Can you do that? Why not? She surveys their bleak surroundings and shivers. Dace resumes. Evil angels sentenced to the abyss, long before Christianity. Still chained within the blackness, held there, awaiting judgment day. Gratefully, she catches Chai hollering, Try it now! Reaching for a moment in her backpack, she gives him an unenthused, Thank you. Something drops. She looks up and around. Chai is no longer present. She gasps. Dace's eyes burst open, and he restrains her from the circle's edge. The camera rests beside it. Chai! She shouts into the void. There's a low whistle from the blackness. God! She sobs while searching about. He must have gotten too close in the dark. Maybe. The two-way radio erupts. Bugby? Bugby! Report! Um, stand by. She plucks the camera and plays the last clip. It shows an approach to the hole, but points back to her, saying... Thank you. It then directs into the pit before dropping with the sound of a sharp, quivering wince. She abandons all self-restraint. Chai, we're coming to get you. Hang on. Dace shows concern and places a hand over his heart. His breathing heightens. Bugby, damn it, what happened? Do you have eyes on him? She fumbles with the walkie. Stand by. Stand by, sir. Dan, are you okay? Dan! Fine, I'm fine. He recognizes her genuine concern and staggers from the hole. Tied off in their vests, she connects the camera to a cable. A push broom is slid over the grim hole. With the lit-up camcorder dangling over the end, she feeds it down. Please. He watches the connected monitor. It's just darkness down there. Cracks riddle the otherwise perfectly smooth inner walls. That's it, she says. That's a hundred feet. Should we run up and get more cable? He shakes his head. If he did fall in, it would take a miracle to survive that. Bugby, goddammit, report! Blares over the walkie. Flustered, she throws it into the pit. Covering her mouth, she begins rocking. 
Oh God. Oh my God. Dace reaches out to console her, but refrains. The following morning is overcast and colder than usual outside the imposing structure of San Francisco City Hall. In full dress uniform and hat, Bugby approaches the concrete steps. She pauses to gather herself when an uncanny feeling turns her around. Dace stands there in a sharp black suit with his well-worn cane. Let's take a walk. I can't, she says. I have... He cuts her off. We have a meeting at the mayor's office in ten minutes. He marches ahead. She looks back and forth between him and the commanding government building and hesitantly opts to follow. I fear I'm responsible for unleashing something unspeakable upon this earth. Let me guess, you think it leads to hell? He stops and looks her in the eye. No, I do not. Her sarcasm abates. What's the one thing all our theories and events have in common? I don't know. Pure evil? Death. Nothing more. Just death. A shuttle bus lets out passengers. He proceeds past them. She looks at her watch and then catches up. You're talking about dead grass, bacteria, and insects. Yes, yes. The dead rodents, dinosaurs, the murders, sacrificial altar, even the old dead cottage itself. So just tell me, what do we say? What do you think is responsible? He halts. You don't get it. While we look for how this or that died, the most basic thing all these have in common is simply the fact of death. But not everyone connected with this has even died. Death may only get so far. Maybe just a cold, a fight, an accident, or a mistake. Wait, you're saying just death is down there? No curse, no red guy with a pitchfork or a demon? Death has no motivation. It is, after all, dead. It is life itself that finds the means to die. We only feel a need to give identity to something which really has none. She looks at her buzzing phone. I'm sorry, but I have to go. He blocks her. Think about it. A demon, the devil, or Count Dracula still contains some spiritual essence, something of will. But death is not a ghost. It's what snatches that ghost away. She's struck with a realization. Our psychic. That's why she couldn't pick up anything. He nods. Because there's nothing down there to communicate with. So what are we supposed to tell them? First of all, we are not going to tell them any of that shit. She cracks a smile. I'm not going to lie. What really is going on? I honestly don't know. But I do know death's lure and power only got stronger the deeper we got. I realized that if I ever reached it, the source, I... She cuts him off. Would have to be dead. I may come off a bit morose, but I like myself now. I'm afraid of dying, Gwen. Truth be known, I'm terrified of it. She is humbled. But you can't tell me you don't still want to know what's down there. He deflates. We just can't take any chances on what may happen next. But how can we or anyone stop death? We can't kill what's already dead. So we treat it like any other dead thing. We put it in its grave. I think the ancients, whoever they were, entombed whatever's down there for a very good reason. We need to rebury that thing right now and hope it goes down quiet to heaven. Are we on the same page? She takes a deep breath. If I still have a job. Approaching midnight, a nearly full moon illuminates the gathering fog. 
The new, crudely formed rectangular shield is made of rebar and micro-reinforced ultra-high performance concrete. Ten feet thick, it stands on its end beside the pit, chained and ready to be tipped. A large skull has been etched onto it to warn the future curious. The scene resembles a giant open grave with a tombstone. Alone, Dace steps off the ladder, parts the safety fencing, and approaches the opening. From a leather satchel, he extracts a white, long stem rose. Cautiously, he extends it over the vile hole as its petals blacken and wilt off into the unlit depths. Giving thought to his satchel, he tosses it into the deep and listens for a sound that never comes. It begins to sprinkle. His eyes flutter closed and he stands paralyzed. The wind presses against his back, pushing him toward the inviting darkness. Teetering near its edge, he leans precariously forward. Bugby is there. She gently pulls him away. Dan, what are you doing here? Noting her civilian clothing, he comes to his senses and staggers toward the exit. Paying Chai my last respects before we reseal it. Dan. He turns to the abyss. I thought I was winning there for a while, but I've only wasted my life searching for something that was already patiently waiting for me. That makes me a fool, and I'm still going to die. He retreats toward the ladder. Wait. Tiredly, he turns and their eyes meet. She raises her gun. What was in the bag, Dan? What? Nothing. Really? Not the missing clothing of a woman you murdered ten months back? He is taken aback. She peers at the gloomy hole. Smart place to dispose of evidence, I'll give you that. Just in time, too. Gwen, where's this coming from? You think we gave you access this whole time because you're such a gifted intellect? He shows surprise. Please move away from that thing. I believe it's affecting you again. Yeah, that must be it. Why do you think Sergeant West kept a homicide detective on an archaeological excavation? For once, he is at a loss for words. You never asked me about her case, identity, or who may have taken her life. You only cared about this goddamn circle. That's because you resented it every time I established something you couldn't. She gathers herself. I think at your core, you are a good man. You called in the body because you wanted to get caught. I think you're reaching and desperate. This won't get you your badge back. She winces and shakes it off. It was the next best thing to turning yourself in. Sorry, he counters. Seems like a stretch. Her composure crumbles. But you're such an insufferably condescending, self-indulgent bastard. You found yourself enjoying it. All the while, part of you hoped I would finally stop you. He notes her position, two steps from the precipitous edge. Listen to me. It's that ungodly abyss. It's influencing your head just as it did even mine a few moments ago before you pulled me away. With murderous eyes, she cocks the pistol. Brash enough to call in a murder you just committed. He discreetly eyes her weapon and takes a careful step closer. She tenses up. Gwen, were we ever really friends then? Her heart sinks. Were you always thinking about killing me? He hesitates and calculates his distance to her weapon. She tears up. You made me feel small, and you would listen to Chai, but you wouldn't listen to me. He reflects on her words and then shrugs. God! She writhes in frustration. I even point a fucking gun in your face, and you're still the cockiest son of a bitch ever. Gwen, look at me. Look at me. 
You may not admit it, but I know you. He advances a bold step. At your core, I think you're a good person too. This much disdain just isn't who you are. Her grip on the pistol tightens. Fog vapor swirls delicately into the shadowy depths. It's over, she says. I lost. She swings the gun into her mouth and clenches her eyes. Stunned, he stands, frozen. Starting to squeeze the trigger, she flinches at the sound of a distant boom. Disoriented, she scans about. What was that? I believe our bulldozer fell in last night, finally hitting bottom. The ground quakes. He glances to her gun and then to the pit as a thousand thoughts race through his eyes. Dear God, I understand now. She looks about with a lost expression. I was still thinking like a mortician. Death was always at its core, but on a far greater scale than I imagined. She struggles to process what is happening. This is not a tomb, Gwen. It's a vault. A vault? But death, how is that valuable? No, not that kind of vault. It's been hiding something, protecting something. Protecting what? That much energy buried deep in our world can have only one purpose. Her face goes white. He shuts his eyes. Evil angels sentenced to the abyss, long before Christianity. She puts the pieces together as he recites them. Still chained within the blackness, held there awaiting. She finishes it. Judgment Day. They set eyes upon the grisly pit. He turns away and mutters, Wow, I was really overthinking this. Dan, if that thing just went off for real, wouldn't we be dust already? He notes her unguarded weapon. A low crackling rises to the surface. She listens intently. Wait, I think something is coming up. She whips around to the standing shield. In a blink, she is struck and slammed onto her back. Her exposed hand instantly turns gray as she screams in agony, releasing the gun into the depths. The sprinkling turns to rain. She looks up at his imposing form as they lock eyes. His gaze shifts to the toxic shaft beside her. He goes to a knee and grips her shoulder. Trembling, she raises her arm in a defensive posture. Stay calm, he says while squinting through the fog. It may come back around. What? I'm not even sure it was human, but I am pretty sure you're his type. Panting, she eyes him with mistrust while growing dizzy. What's happening to me? I believe the dead blood from your hand is working its way through your system now poisoning you. The earth shivers. The shield tips toward them with a low moan as it sinks into the wet soil. He seizes her and pulls her well clear. The rain becomes a downpour. Mud sloshes down the excavation walls as the ladder topples into the sludge. Brandishing his cane, he stands guardedly over her while groping for his phone. She shakes her head with a defeated face. We all have our demons, don't we, Dan? Something about her statement registers, and he gives her a slow, side look. Just tell me, before I die. Tell me I pegged you from the start, you sick fucker. He appears conflicted. Most of the excavation lights cut out. Her eyes open wide as a twisted form lurches through the fog. Dan, I just had a big realization too. He kneels to her. I am a shitty homicide detective. He smiles. Yeah, kind of. Her eyes roll back into her head. 
He looks up as if suddenly aware of something and grips his chest. His collapse beside her barely registers. Her head spinning, she detects a shift in movement while sliding past him. Though innocuous, there is nothing to take hold of as her momentum slowly builds toward the pit's gaping maw through the syrupy surface. The wailing wind swirls up from the darkness. Struggling to focus, she manages herself up a bit, forcing herself to consciousness. Dan. He remains motionless. The wind and rain pick up. The sinking slab tips toward her, but is caught by its restraining chains. Woozy, she discerns a nude, hunched figure bearing a gleaming hand sickle standing over Dace. It stares inquisitively at him and then directs its gaze at her. A faint whirlwind forms around the mouth of the abyss. Her squirming legs are but a few meters away as the shield strains against its chains in her direction. The weakest link reveals itself as it begins to separate. Peering back, she observes the deluge enveloping Dace, with the beast now absent. Slipping closer to her extinction, she perceives a strange, erratic sound rising from the pit. The funnel of fog and rain attracts lightning strikes, exposing glimpses of a pale form making its way up from the extreme depths. The ground jolts violently. The chains snap, and the shield crashes down, crushing the guardrails. She is allowed a brief exhalation. Her attention returns to the shield as it heaves upward. Immeasurable pressure keeps the substantial slab levitated, as if to receive her. Her panic magnifies as she scrambles to halt her advance. The quaking reaches a crescendo, and a full eruption blasts forth as the bulldozer's remains eject miles into the air over the Pacific. The force throws her back and restores the seal to an upright posture as the giant front blade of the battered machine collides with the earth before her. She lays still in the steady rain, half expecting some other biblical proportion event when Dace drifts slowly by, otherwise unmoving. A low groan marks the shield's renewed, subtle sway. She reaches out and takes hold of him, only to find herself going with him back toward the open pit. With one dead hand, she can either grip his body or the solid bulldozer piece. Grabbing the stable chunk of metal, she attempts to restrain him with her legs, but is unable. Stop! Stop! Please! Helplessly, she watches his inevitable progress toward the opening. When he begins to rouse... Dan! Wake up, Dan! He goes inanimate once more. Throwing self-preservation aside, she releases the steel and reaches out for his leg as they draw closer to this abyss which, it seems, will not be denied. Thunder and lightning explode across the sky. Failing to effect a rescue, she clamps her eyes shut but then senses a halt in their motion and looks up. Braced before the hole stands the menacing, deformed soul. She squirms frantically to escape, but the steady sludge only delivers her closer. With a deranged shriek, it rears back its blade and swings down to her neck. Instinctively, she blocks it with her dead hand and feels nothing. Pleasantly surprised, she wrestles for the sickle. Alas, weakened and one-handed, she is unable. It clutches her by the jacket collar and raises her. Face to face, her expression goes blank as she gapes at its gaunt, grotesque likeness. Drool seeps from its swollen, wheezing lips, its human-like features mostly dead and blackened. Shaking her head, she cannot look away until her horror culminates into a piercing, defeated scream. Mustering her diminished strength, 
she ineffectually labors to force it into the abyss. It sets its sharp metal against her throat as if to measure its placement for a killing stroke. Raising it back, it hesitates. With a look of loss, she gazes into its face. Please. The wind howls against the shield as it continues leaning its way. With a feminine touch, she places her hand on its disfigured face and looks deep into its soul. Chai, look at me. He seems disoriented. She sobs. This whole time, tell me it wasn't you. Discolored fluid drips from his one functional eye, blinking rapidly and involuntarily. Slowly and deliberately, she presses her hand onto his chest softly. Offering no resistance, he tips backward into the deep with a distorted screech. She spots the shield coming down and raises her arm in a futile effort to block it when she is ripped away and rolls just clear of the angry slab. Dace lunges but stumbles as it impacts with a deep, rolling thud. Afraid to look, she turns and recognizes that he did not escape the plunging shield. She slumps, curls into a ball, and breaks down. Exactly one year passes. The day is sunny at Sutro Heights Park. Wearing white sportswear and a realistic prosthetic hand, Bugby steps up with Dace's dog. Within a newly constructed concrete water feature, she floats several white lilies. A bronze statue of Adolf Sutro is mounted at its center, smiling grandly. A historical plaque displays his biography and a description of his cottage, which once stood here. She lowers her head for a moment of silence, and then departs. The little pug remains and lets out a bark. She beholds the conspicuously solitary, 25-foot-wide circular fountain and gently pulls the dog away. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life. And if you already know the source of stress, BetterHelp can help you find ways to cope and deal with it. School's back in session for the kiddos, meaning that there's more time than ever to be alone with your thoughts. And that's not always a good thing. Sure, there are other ways to occupy your time, such as games, nature walks, hobbies, and the like. I like to read a good book or listen to my favorite podcast. But it feels so good to be open and honest, two of the many ingredients needed for better mental health. And I love how my BetterHelp therapist provides me with the distance and semi-anonymity to do just that. BetterHelp is real, professional counseling tailored to your needs that you can do online. It's more affordable than traditional therapy, and for those who need it, financial aid is available, meaning the people who need it most can have better access to help that's, well, better. Thanks to BetterHelp, it's never been easier for me or others to care for their mental health. All you have to do is take the first step. Most anyone can benefit from counseling, whether it's depression, anxiety, internal struggles, or any other problem standing in your way. BetterHelp is the tried and true tool to get you up to task again. This is no gimmick, folks. It's professional therapy online. Quick, discreet, convenient, and at a price that's attainable. Here's how it works. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with your own licensed therapist who specializes in your specific needs. You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. You can also schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. 
In short, you'll never be winging it again. Your personal counselor will always be close at hand. No office visits necessary. It's professional help right in your pocket. Not a fan of being on screen? That's okay. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. And remember, you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horrorhill. That's betterhel dot com slash horrorhill. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Our next tale introduces us to a boy named Nick, whose family has just moved after a tragic loss. It can be hard facing the change of a new place in the most normal of circumstances, let alone when dealing with the loss of a parent. It can be a lonely time, but as our protagonist is about to learn, not all friends are worth keeping. We moved in a year ago, a month after Mom died. Just me, Dad, Piper, and an old salt-crusted Victorian with big dormer windows and a swooping front porch. It's not much to look at. A faded blue clapboard construction was fronted by a yellow piss lawn and the Safeway parking lot view. Not exactly what I expected when Dad told me we were moving to the coast. He had to get away from her or from the memory of her anyways. Some bullshit line about missing her too much. Something like that. Nick, he'd say, with the nicotine lines sprinting away from the corners of his mouth. She haunts me. Every night I can feel her in the room haunting me. It's not good for me here no more, or for you and your sister. We need a fresh start somewhere else but I knew it wasn't a fresh start he needed. No, he wanted to run. Every time we went to the store, I could see it in his nervous, washed-out eyes, darting this way and that and looking for the I-know-what-you-did looks. The tight smiles with the curt nods. The poisoned glances. And at home, the trash cans are boiling over with empty vodka bottles and crumpled up cartons of camel lights. The floor is ashed over with dust. No one to clean them up anymore. So, one day in late October, he pulled up in front of my school with a U-Haul tacked to the back of our rusted-out 98 Chevy Silverado, and we left. No warning. No time for goodbyes. Just a quick... Get in, kids. Found us a place up the coast. A good place. A place we can get right again. Piper cried the entire way. And me? Well, I just bit my tongue. The fear always starts in my toes when he speaks. A sinister prickle blooms through my feet and spreads up my legs like a swarm of hatchling spiders searching for a meal. Some writhing, webbed-over treat to devour. I can help you. I can make it all go away. The wallpaper man's voice is brittle and flutters through the air of my room like a wisp of acrid smoke. Will it gives it to me? Will it gives me the pain? I shudder in my bed, pull the sheets higher, close my eyes and hope to snuff it out, drown it in the black void of my dreams. Anything to make it stop, to make it go away. But I know better. 
he never stops until I answer. Sometimes I try to tune him out when I'm feeling brave. I think about things like Piper's smile when I tell her my stupid knock-knock jokes. It's crooked perfect, with a little gap between the incisors that lights up the room when she laughs. I think about Mom. About how she smelled like lavender when she hugged me. I miss those hugs a lot. When those things don't work, I focus on the fear when I'm too afraid to think about anything else. The color of it. Black. Definitely black. Its consistency. Thick, like ragu. Its taste is bitter copper-like when I bite my lip. Like how I imagine battery acid tastes. It doesn't work. Nothing does. Nothing but answering him. The wallpaper man is used for kids who can run. Me, I have no use for legs. The ALS took them six months ago. Most people are nice enough when they see me. Sure, they stare a little too long and nod a little too hard when they say hello, but they mean well. And the women... Do they drive me nuts with those big, fake, plastic smiles and how they talk to me? Like I'm dumb or something? Like I'm a two-year-old? I'm not. I'm 16. I just look young. The men, well, they mostly ignore me. But whatever. I can't say I blame them. Who wants to spend time talking to death warmed over in a wheelchair? I sure as hell wouldn't. I can't even stand to look at myself in the mirror. I try not to. I know how I look. I have eyes encased in sharp sockets, and my mouse brown hair sprouts from my head in weird directions that don't make sense no matter how hard I try to smooth it down. The right side of my face droops like a stroke victim, the muscles frozen in place and not quite working right, the other half compensating with a strange twitch when I talk like I've stuffed my mouth full of sour candy. And the pain. It's my entire existence. Cramps that go on forever. Muscle spasms and skin sores on my legs. Joints that lock up like rusted old latches. Despite this, as I said, most people are nice. Everyone except Roger Ellis. The bathroom door bangs open, and I know it's him even before he speaks. Hey, look who we have here. It's Nikki Twitch. Leave me alone, Roger, I mutter into the floor. Before I have a chance to brace myself, he's behind me, whipping my wheelchair around, sending the contents of my catheter bag all over my lap. The smell of ammonia stings my nostrils and I frantically wipe at it with a nearby paper towel, hoping to soak it up before it sets into my jeans. Hey, someone needs to cheer... The corners of his mouth tick into an evil grin. Oh my god, did you piss yourself? You did, didn't you? He barks out a laugh that tells me something bad is coming. That's so disgusting! Wait till everyone hears about this! Pissing your pants? What a baby! He sprouts a few more jags of laughter and then stomps out of the bathroom, leaving me alone with my urine-stained lap. Roger has everything. Perfect bone structure. A strong jawline was already sprouting stubble. Broad shoulders. Girls are chasing him everywhere he goes. He even drives a red Dodge Charger his lawyer father bought him. He still has a mother, one who loves him. It's not fair. He's everything I want to be, and everything I hate. A ray of moonlight cuts through the blinds and washes over the yellowed wallpaper of my room, over the wallpaper man. Ten-inch serrated fingers fall past a set of disjointed knees, angular shoulder blades, Bones that slope sharply into a razor-blade neck. 
His skull is long, segmented, and punctuated by a jaw that curls inward, bones crackling. Rigid eye sockets bulge from either side of his head and shift when he moves. Four eyes in all. It's like something from one of those alien movies, but so much worse because I can't see all of him. I'm forced to imagine what he looks like, to picture the true horror beneath the wallpaper. When he speaks, the slick, black rows of teeth sometimes flicker against it. The skin that I imagine to be thick and pocked and reptilian. Three. Has it brought them to me? Give me the names, and I will take the pain, yes? The wallpaper ripples as he slides through it like oil, his joints working in a sick, unnatural fashion. I think of an arthritic centipede. My stomach sours at the sight. The putrid sweet odor of his breath washes over me as he nears, his foul exhalations awaiting my response. Night after night, the same question. Will I give him his gifts? Will I give him his three? And night after night, I croak out a wet gurgle, no. My voice a weak, dry breeze. Baby vomit. I don't want him to hurt anyone, but tonight, something's different. Tonight, something cold boils through my blood to face another day with Roger Ellis in it. Without thinking, I whisper his name. I half expect to see Roger sitting at his desk the next morning, slouched down jock-style in his chair. Maybe it was all a dream. Maybe I'm just losing my mind talking to empty walls. But as I roll past, his desk sits wonderfully empty. The sight of it fills me with relief. I can breathe. No looking over my shoulder. For today, at least. And it only gets better. He doesn't come to school the next day, or even the next. It isn't until Thursday that I start to worry. Is he dead? Surely not, right? I didn't want to kill him or anything. Maybe just punish him a bit. Make him feel the way he makes me feel. Like trash. Worthless for a while. It's not until Friday that I finally see him. He sits with his head cupped in his hands when I enter the class. He doesn't bother to look up. A thick swoop of hair obscures his hateful eyes, and his foot taps out an irregular beat on the floor. A frantic tap, 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 that sends me to my desk a little faster. As I glide past him, he pushes a burst of air through his lips, and a strange odor tickles my nose the sticky tack of glue fumes. I watch Roger throughout the entire class. There's something off about the way he sits, hunched forward like an arthritic 80-year-old. But there's something else. Something worse. His skin. It's taken on a strange, chalky texture like drywall. Like it would crumble beneath my fingertips if I touched it. At one point, Roger feels the heat of my gaze and his eyes flick to mine. I quickly look away. For some reason, I expect him to know this was my fault, that I did this to him. But what I see staring back at me isn't anger. It's fear. A lake of it. Cold, clear, fear. It's crisp outside as I roll up to the curb and wait for Dad to pick me up. I shiver in my windbreaker and wonder how late he'll be today. Yesterday, it was half an hour. The day before, 45 minutes and reeking of booze. If he's that late today, I'll freeze. A shrill whine snaps me out of the thought. An ambulance. Distant, 
but coming closer. Then I hear the cry. Rogers. Pain drenched and terrified, like he's burning alive. He stumbles from the soccer field, arms draped around two of his jock friends. Two cheerleaders swirl in front of them like gnats, screaming for help. As they near, I squint and try to see what's wrong. His legs seem okay. His arms are fine. Nothing's broken, but his face is all twisted up, and his hands, they're... flapping. Dripping watery pink fluid everywhere. And... Oh, God. The skin. Like a pair of panicky birds. It's gone. All of it. In its place, fibrous red muscle entwined with nerve endings. Strips of the bone peek through the tissue. And there's something else. Sticky white clumps of... paste? Speckled all over his palms, his forearms. It coats his naked digits and runs up to his wrists, where the skin is peeling back in tattered strips. I choke back a slug of bile. Mr. Johnson abandons his post, directing traffic, and sprints over. What happened? One of Roger's friends looks up wild-eyed, the spray of freckles over his nose suddenly dark in the afternoon sun. It... it just... He looks away and shakes his head, looking back with tears. His skin just came off, Mr. Johnson, like a pair of gloves. We played catch and Roger started screaming when he caught the ball. We didn't know what happened at first. Roger unleashes a painful howl that cuts through my chest. I did this to him. I made this happen. The ambulance tears up to the curb a moment later and I watch the EMTs load Roger up, his eyes wild with pain, rotating in their sockets like dirty brown marbles. That night, my eyelids scraped open to sheer darkness. A tomb. I can't see the streetlight through my blinds. My torso is slicked with sweat. Can't find the assuring glow of my alarm clock on my dresser. Roger's skin. I can't stop thinking about it. The way it sloughed off like boiled meat. The way it... A chill washes down my arms and my spine. Someone's watching me. I can feel it. I can feel... him. My mouth goes sandpaper dry, my tongue swelling in my mouth. I can't handle him tonight. I can't give him another name and do this to someone else, do what I did to Roger. I won't. I'll... N Nick? Are you awake? Piper. She can't come in here, not now. My heart assaults my ribs. Not with him. But he's only ever talked to me, never to her, in more than a year. And there's something wrong with her. I can feel the panic radiating off of her. I can hear it in her voice. She needs me. Hey there, yeah, you okay? I ask. Can I sleep with you tonight? Of course, get in here, I say, lifting the sheets. She used to sleep with me when she was little, slipped into my room clutching her teddy bear and complaining of nightmares. It was when the fighting got too rough, when Dad would lose his temper with Mom, and the snap of his voice would pour through the house like dull thunder. And now she's ten, sprouting knobby knees and braces, her features blooming into those of a young woman. Every time I look at her, it hurts. All I see is Mom. Piper's all I have left of her. I drape an arm around her as she slides in, realizing she's shivering. Hey, hey, what's the matter? You have a bad dream or something? She shakes her head 
her hair brushing against my chin. What then? It was... She shudders and lets out a sob. Go on, you can tell me. You know that, right? She nods her head and lies quietly for a long moment before saying, It was Dad. He was in my room again. I stiffen, every wasted muscle in my body snapping taut. My throat glues shut as I run a hand over her head and soothe her until her breathing evens out. Then I lie wide awake, my heart thundering so hard that I think it'll burst. The day I found Mom in the bathroom with the empty bottle and a few stray pills scattered around her fingers like snowflakes. Dead-eyed and foaming at the mouth, she lay there motionless and cold. The hem of her sweater hiked up just enough for me to see the purple patch of skin peeking through. Dad always liked to keep his handiwork hidden. I lie cardboard stiff for hours, waiting and waiting and waiting. Unable to sleep, staring at the wall. I finally catch a flicker of movement above my headrest. A seriform grin. I say his name. I wake Piper and have her help me into my wheelchair in the morning. The kitchen has been fitted for me, the one thing Dad's done right around here. So I make a breakfast of scrambled eggs, sausage, orange juice, and toast, just like we used to with Mom on Saturday mornings. We eat in silence, and she barely touches her food, pushing it around her plate and glancing down the hall at Dad's bedroom door until it's time for the bus. Piper just sits there. As she grabs her backpack, I take hold of her arm. Hey, that stuff with Dad, it's never going to happen again. Ever. You don't have to worry about him anymore, okay? She stands frozen in place, her lips pulled into a thin line. Okay? Her delicate jaw bunches tight. Again, I see Mom... That waterfall of brown chocolate hair and bubble of a nose. The warm olive skin that's so different than mine. She issues a quick nod and her eyes flick down. She doesn't believe me. She doesn't believe me, but she should. After I tell her I love her, I stare at Dad's door for a long time. My fingers vice grip the armrests of my wheelchair, clenching and unclenching and clenching again until my forearms feel like blocks of cement. After an hour, I knock once, twice. I expect to hear his voice, groggy and graveled over with sleep, expecting him to yell at me to go away like he does every morning when I wake him for my ride to school. Nothing. Hesitantly, I push the door open and roll through. Dust motes clutter the air, and the carpet is scattered with dirty laundry, greasy t-shirts and jeans and boxers, a crumpled construction vest. An empty bottle of Jack Daniels lies cockeyed on his dresser, and the room reeks like he hasn't opened a window in weeks. The blinds are drawn. As I roll through the gloom towards his bed, I catch sight of his crumpled form beneath the blankets. Dad? I ask. Silence. I ask again. More silence. I reach out, clutch the comforter, and hesitate. The last time I woke him after a night on the bottle, I got a black eye for my trouble. I clench my jaw and tug at it. The comforter rustles down over something thin and fibrous, inch by inch, until it's visible. Wallpaper. Miles of it. That ugly brown and yellow striped stuff on the walls of his room. It blossoms beneath his bed and runs up and over his arms, torso, and legs, 
encases his skull and stretches taut over the outline of his gaping mouth. I can't tell for certain, but his eyes appear to be stretched wide, and his head is angled back in a sick fashion that makes me think he saw it coming. I find a crease in the wallpaper near his chest and take hold of it. Pull. A sprinkle of sand shivers through. I pull harder, and a stream of it spills onto the bed and scatters to the floor. I know I should stop, that I should turn and wheel myself from the room, but I can't. My fingers working as if operated by a puppeteer. As I unwrap the wallpaper man's cancerous gifts, beads of sweat erupt across my forehead and my back. And then I'm ripping it off in chunks, tearing it open like a toddler on Christmas, anxious for his shiny new toy. Except what reveals itself is anything but shiny. Rivulets of sand drift down to expose a pale cathedral of bone. His ribcage. Nausea churns through my intestines, and I nearly retch, but somehow keep ripping, tearing the wallpaper off a pitted femur, a wrist bone, his skull. It's bleached white and vacant, the eye sockets two black pits of tar peeking through the grit. I slip the comforter back up and wheel out of the room, drifts of sand crunching beneath my wheels my stomach assaulting itself, spasming with disgust, but also a sick satisfaction that it's finally over. Piper never has to worry again. Piper. The wallpaper man won't stop without his third. He's warned me. I know what he wants. The thought sends a wave of goose flesh rippling down my arms. That won't happen. He can't have her. I have his final name. I've had it all along. But first, I need to make a call. I wait for hours, the house creaking around me as I sit in the silence of my room and stare at the wallpaper. Toy bears marching with trumpets, leading a troop of stuffed animals through a candy cane forest. Rabbits and deer and bug-eyed badgers followed behind, each with an instrument of their own like a crazy, never-ending parade. It's awful stuff. Probably some baby's room before I moved in. It's likely a boy's room, based on the heavy bent towards blues and yellows. Dad said he'd take the stuff down in a couple of weeks. Yeah, right. Decayed fragments of light peek around the curtains and tell me it's getting late. Aunt Lauren will be here soon. A half an hour or so. She'll stop me if she gets here before I do this. Look at her, and all the strength will run right out of me. I could barely hang up on her as it was. I can't wait any longer. From my lap... I take the steak knife and press it against the left pad of my palm, feeling its cold pressure dig into my skin. Stop. Moisture frames my vision. I don't want to do this. I don't want to die even if I don't have that long left. The thought of never seeing Piper smile again, never hearing her laugh or wave at me from her bike, never telling her that I love her, that everything will be okay because it will. Aunt Lauren loves Piper almost as much as I do, like Mom did. She'll take good care of her, better than I could anyway, and she won't let her see what happened to Dad and what's about to happen to me. She'll protect her. She'll give her the childhood she deserves, the childhood I can't. I've never seen the wallpaper man during the day. I have to give him his name right now. I don't even know if this will work, but I have to try. Before it's too late. I bring the knife back into place, and a red bubble surrounds the blade. I hiss and grit my teeth so hard it feels as if my molars will crack. 
I slide the blade the length of my lifeline and nearly pass out. The pain is indescribable. Somehow, I manage to keep it together and roll over to the wall. My blood looks black as oil as I press my hand against the wallpaper and hold it there. Say my name. Nothing happens. I can feel the blood pulsing out of the wound in thick torrents, turning the wallpaper sticky, slick. My head goes woozy and I struggle to focus. I whisper my name again. Still, nothing. My hand slips an inch. Two inches. Catches. Wallpaper-coated fingers around my wrist. A sudden, piercing cold rips through my arm, mixing with the warm gush of blood on the wall. I take the pain, yes? Yes. Yes. The hiss is otherworldly, eternal, reverberating through my chest and washing my body in awful, undulating bursts. I've never known pain like this before, like holding my hand in a hot pan of bacon grease. The fingers unfurl and I thump back into my chair, unable to move or blink. I can only stare dumbly at my wrist, at the crusted black skin flaking off where the fingers held me. A shearing sound brings my attention back to the wall, where a single talon-coated finger, at least ten inches long, cuts through the vinyl material in a clean vertical line. Then, through the rift, another digit emerges, and another, and another. So many fingers are spilling through that I lose count. At least a dozen in all, maybe more. Black, knotted knuckles. Cruel-looking blades extend from each fingertip. They are impossibly long and pop and croak as they curl in and out. Do not be afraid. I take the pain. I take it all away. A gust of something foul spills through the rift, a noxious rot that sours my nostrils and sets my eyes to watering. I blink away the tears and stare dumbfounded at the hundreds of miniature patches of wallpaper tearing away from the wall and migrating toward the hand, crawling like maggots over one another and slithering onto its palm, leaving sticky trails of something mucus-like behind. Before my eyes, they writhe and contort and twist into one another in sick, disjointed motions combining to sprout wings and antenna and hungry, sucking mouths. I watch in disgust, unable to avert my eyes from the seizing horde as it convulses into something I recognize. Butterflies. Dozens and dozens of wallpaper butterflies. A burst of rot spills through once more, and before I can make a sound... They take flight and hurtle toward me with terrifying speed. Their razor-sharp wings lash against my skin, their stabbing legs piercing. I gag and choke on their rotten bodies as they work down my throat and burrow into my stomach, into the soft gelatin of my eyeballs. Pure agony swims through every cell of my being as they shred through muscle and bone alike my life spilling out of me in a thousand cuts at once. Gray. White. Muted, colorless shades. I am everything, everywhere, all at once, flicking into existence. My new body feels strange, electric, dangerous. A girl's room. I can tell by the mountain of stuffed animals bulging from the corner hammock, 
dogs and cats and smiling monkeys. A jewelry case frosts a white dresser. Posters of boy bands and horses coat the walls. Beaded necklaces are draped over a rocking chair, and in the corner, beneath a plush bedspread, a spray of hair drifts over a pillow. It's hard to see the color clearly through the striped wallpaper. It's dark, maybe amber, maybe brown. I can't quite tell with my new eyes. All four of them. You've been listening to The Wallpaper Man by Caleb Stevens. Author Caleb Stevens is a novelist living in Denver, Colorado, and his short stories have been published in Suspense Magazine, Hello Horror, Ink Stains, Horror Tales Podcast, Dark Tales, and Hinnom Magazine, for which he is the assistant editor. He is represented by Anne Collette of the Reese Literary Agency. You can learn more at www.calebstevensauthor.com. That's Stevens with a PH. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and I'll see you right back here at this same time next week for more terrifying tales, sinister stories, and frightening fables. All that good stuff. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I do take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure that you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. You.
tales for dark nights.